and entertaining this idea. So, I'll just say that um, his bio is in our program, so I'm sure you all have read it. Um, but please, let's give a really great warm welcome to Ron Reed. You know, it sort of reminds me, I have to tell you, the first church I served in was right outside of Philadelphia, and my boss, the rector, was a bit of a wag. And uh, he put an advertisement in the local community paper, you know, about St. Thomas Episcopal Church and all that. And he put in the, the, the sort of, I guess, what you call a byline or whatever, it says, come to St. Thomas early and get a good seat at the back. <laughs> because, uh, at least in the Episcopal Church tradition, people are notorious for sitting way at the back. I guess it's a theatrical distance or something. Helen, uh, I wanted to say thank you for inviting me. And I have a little envelope in here, uh, and inside's a check, and then you can use it for panties or pants or all I don't know. You're not. You're not looking for girdles, I guess. So whatever. But thank you. This is from Catherine and me. I want to know something else. Where's Nash? Well, okay, um, I wanted to meet Nash. How many of you know Nash? You know Nash? Raise your hand. You know Nash? Well, Nash is famous um, on Facebook. He really is. Now, Nash has a very serious um, interest in the elementary canal of human beings. Wouldn't you say, Helen, something like that? Particularly the end product. And so there's a lot of, I guess you might call it poopy comments and things like that. And Catherine and I think they're funny. Now, Catherine and I, we have, we came together, and we're sort of had this background that's very similar. Catherine, raise your hand. The good-looking blonde over there. And uh, our background is such kind of as English and Scottish and Celtic. And I think that rouses in us an interest similar to Nash's. And, and, and if you hear a lot of people, particularly Scots, you know, they really, they use a lot of four-letter words and uh, seem, to very art, seem to be very articulate with them. So Catherine says one of the things that really makes us compatible is that we're potty mouths. So that, that does inspire a joke. And this is it. This is for Nash. There are three little boys, and they're walking around, and they come by big church and one of the little boys looks up and he looks at the others and he says uh, what's in here he says, well let's go in and find out so they go in and they go into uh, the, the main part of the church the nave and there's all this you know nice looking stuff and it's kind of quiet and pleasant one of them says you know i don't know a lot but i know they do like that baptism stuff in here they put people in the water and do something, you know. I guess. Well, you know, I always kind of wanted to be baptized. So they said, yeah, what do you do? Well, they dunk him in water. So they look around, and the, the font's too high, and there's no water in it anyway in this church. So they go into the men's room, and they open up the door into the, into the throne, the toilet. And said, we, we could do it in here. There's water in here. So the other two helped the little kid, and they kind of dunk him in the water. He comes out and do the whole thing. And uh, so he's satisfied with it. Takes a little toilet paper or whatever, wipes off, gets dried out a little bit. And one says to the other, I wonder what kind of Christian he is now. And he says, I think he's Episcopalian. <laughs> Well, I'm an Episcopalian with a potty mouth. I'll be back to that in a minute. Uh, I was uh, looking up as sitting here and listening to that music. My God. Let's have another round of applause. Well, I was telling you, I saw Whiplash last night. Have you seen that? Woo! Wow, what a film. I mean, that really is it's exhausting, too, in some ways. It's really good. Brian thinks so too, don't you? You know it from, see? Good movie, isn't it? Well, I was looking up. Have, have you all noticed the banners at the top here? I mean, those banners are just 
Wonderful. I mean, what a great combination of having what you all are about and, uh, and having those banners. Be a person of character. I mean, I, how can you go wrong with each one of these sayings? I don't care what your background is or any of that. Every one of those things is an, in and of itself a valuable issue of moral character and ethical virtue, isn't it? You couldn't go wrong. Well, I have to tell you with that in mind, my whole life is summarized in about three words. I'm making sure I didn't get a fourth figure. Three words. And that is, life is all about either the power of love or the love of power. And I look back at now, closing in on 69 years, and I think that everything can pretty well be reduced in a formula sense to that reality. So what I'm really talking about here and my disenchantment with the institutional church has to do with that. I'm going to give you a little detail about that, but really I could stop right there and say, I don't care who you are or where you're from or what your community is. If you can bring out and elicit those virtues and be working to help one another deal with the power of love in its practical applications and to resolve issues of the love of power, I don't care what you call yourself. And I knew that that's what Helen was about. There wasn't a doubt in my mind. So of course, Catherine and I are supportive. Now, we're a little lazy on Sunday mornings after some seri long time, so we haven't been very good about coming to Oasis. <laughs> Just a minute. But I think that this community is a very good thing, and I'm, I'm happy that it's happening, and it's a good thing for you all, but it's also good for Kansas City. And we've already heard about a newcomer coming to Kansas City uh, from someone that's been doing some other work for us. And she immediately, I told her about Oasis, and she's going to refer. So. And I know you won't do a lot of referrals. No, I think you should. Now, I want to go back to that. It's not really potty mouth, but it's a bad word I want to use. Now, let me start with another story. When I was in school, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. My field work was in Watertown, which is just west of Cambridge. And it's, and Watertown is uh, more known, well known today because it's where that fellow was found that was one of the bombers, you know, in Boston, just right close to where I was serving at Good Shepherd Episcopal Church. And the, the rector there was a, he was an okay guy, but he was, well, at the very least, very boring. And he, you know, he, he just was so apathetic and about a lot of stuff. And, and I'm not particularly one to be apathetic and I, I can get pretty excited, you know, stuff like that. So there had been an incident at a parish dinner the Thursday before the Sunday I was to preach. And it had to do with a couple boys that made some of the old ladies mad at the dinner, you know, probably just doing kid stuff. So the rector accosted me right before I was to go into the service. And he started laying it on me about those kids about which I knew nothing or could do nothing. And I had spent about almost two years doing stuff there with the youth group. And as Catherine knows, he lit, he scratched my match and I lit up. I didn't say anything, but I was preaching. So I got up and I got on a topic I generally don't deal with very much. It was, I kind of meandered and it was my subconscious meandering. You know, I says, uh, I want to talk about sin. And I said, you know, I think the greatest sin is apathy. And who am I thinking about? I'm looking over at the rector. <laughs> And I said, you know, I think that people who are empathetic, and here's when it happened, are real bastards. 
and I could see that word travel out of my mouth in slow motion. <laughs> you ever had one of those? Bastard, dirt, 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 dirt. <laughs> come back. <laughs> you want to come back? Well, I decided I better sum that whole thing up real quick. I'd already got myself in enough trouble. So I quit, and it was, uh, the service was pretty close to ending, and it ended, and I jumped up and immediately did what little I could do to clean up the mess, and that was, I said, if I've offended anyone this morning by what I've said, I apologize and I ask for your forgiveness. It's all I could do. It was over with. So I'm in New England, right, folks, right? New England. People don't get overtly excited about things and so things were pretty quiet on the way out. I'm at the back door doing the shake hand and greet people and all that. No one's saying anything to me. And I'm, why did I do that? And finally, a lovely little old lady, and she was even smaller than you are a little bit. Little, little sweet. You know, I'd, I'd known her for a couple years. And I'm not very tall, but she had to look up at me and she says, Mr. Reed, anything you say is quite all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, I mean, I couldn't have asked for it any better than that. I mean, that just helped, helped me. And guess what? Here all these years later, so I'm still thinking about that lady. Kind of my point here, folks. To me, there is a big difference between the life of and spiritual life and really the mystical life of how faith emerges and love emerges and the institution that may encapsulate it. Now they can be really linked together with great integrity or you can get the words that the institution spouts and the actions betray the words. I'll bet you've never seen that happen in your life about any institution. Happens all the time. I don't care what, you know, it's not about a church. It's about, you know, all kinds of things in human life. That disconnection, that alienation, which has been massive literature written about that sociologically. So that really f frames the beginning of what I want to say. And that was my experience had been from being 15 years old. <coughs> November the 11th, 1961, I became a confirmed Episcopalian. And it was because I had experienced in a little place in Larnard, Kansas, where my cousins took me to church, a little bitty Episcopal church in which I can best describe, I discovered the beauty of holiness. It was a pretty little place. The priest was sweet and dear. And he saw this little kid, me, and he asked if I wanted to help at the altar, and I didn't know anything. I'm a Methodist kid by background. And um, it was just this beautiful event. And I, I began to understand something about what I would best describe as the hidden nature of what atonement, not the atonement you usually hear about as a fundamentalist, but bringing together that which has been disparate and separated. Now here's another story about that word I used. There's a guy that just died a couple of years ago by the name of Will Campbell. Will Campbell was a Baptist minister down in the South from Mississippi originally. He was very active in the civil rights movement, all that kind of stuff back in the 60s. And I thought about it recently because of remembering Selma and all of that. And Will Campbell got very upset because there were a number of those terrible bomb bombings and deaths and, you know, all kinds of stuff that we've just been talking about in the news recently. And Will was wrought up and he was really upset and he was with the buddy. And he was so upset because one of the people that got killed was a guy named, a young guy named Jonathan Daniels. And Jonathan Daniels was an upperclassman from my school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, some years before I was actually uh, matriculated there. 
And Jonathan Daniels, as a seminarian, had taken the time and the energy. He went down to uh, Mississippi, I think it was, or Alabama. And he was protecting, I think it was a woman, because somebody pulled out a shotgun, I believe it was, and stood in front of her and got his head blown off. It was hideous. Among, and he was one among a number. And Will Campbell really was upset. He was sitting there and thinking about it, weeping a little bit, and he said, his friend is with him. And he said, the people that do that are really bastards. His friend was really kind of like his soulmate in a lot of ways, a real close friend. And his friend looked over at him and said, what'd you say, Will? He said, they're really bastards. And his friend knew he needed to help him. And his friend knew him well enough to know what he needed to do. His friend was an atheist. And his friend said, Will, you're Baptist. I said, yeah, you know that. He said, you believe in original sin, don't you? Yeah. Why? So what? Um, well, Jonathan Daniels and those people that killed him and the KKK members, they were all born into sin according to your theology, weren't they? He said, yeah, so what? Well, if that's the case, they start out all kind of the same, don't they? Well, yeah, so what? He said, then uh, Jonathan Daniels is a bastard, isn't he? Or was a bastard, wasn't he? He said, what do you mean? Well, your theology tells me that all human beings start out as bastards, don't they? They have to be adopted by what you call the Father, God, don't they? Like the Son of God, by the Son of God. Well, that was a life changer for Will. Will began to realize that if he was to deal with the power of love over the love of power, if he was to make a difference in his world, if he was not to just be a self-righteous, liberal, pointy-headed, intellectual Baptist minister in the South taking care of people that thought like him, he was going to have to walk his butt out that door and he was going to have to go find people who were racist, who were murderers, who were members of the KKK, and find out how to relate to them. And that's the way he spent the rest of his life, was coming to terms with bringing the power of love where the love of power was creating massive problems. He's kind of a patron saint of mine because to me, again, it represents how tr the truth of life emerges by whatever factor that you want to describe it, philosophically, theologically, morally, I don't care. That's what's got to happen in life. You've got to create some way to reconcile the dualism that is the, the, the impediment of particularly Western thinking that we dualize everything. And that is what is happening in this society worse than I can remember in my lifetime. You got the righteous and the unrighteous. You've got the ultra conservatives. You've got the ultra liberals. You've got, and everybody's right, aren't they? Look what's happening with the politics in this country. Look what's happening in the Middle East. Look what the kind of things, you probably still have relatives back in Israel, don't you? You know, you hear it every day probably, one way or another. It's terrible. And Will Campbell said, I'm going to find a way to close the gap. And that's what he tried to do. My experience has been over the last 30 years, began when I was still working in New York City, that the Episcopal Church, and I can only speak for that, and other friends who are Episcopalians, and some other uh, guys who are retired clergy from other denominations, but I only speak to the one I know. The triumph in our case of liberalism, the triumph of being on the right side of the issues of sexuality, of being on the right side of the issue of racism, and we are and have been, and I can detail that, has created a core of people who dismissed those who were a little more conservative 
didn't really want them around. Now we do things in a nice way in the Episcopal Church, so we don't, you know, exclude people overtly. We just don't pay attention to them. We just kind of ignore them. Works really well. I was seeing some problems in New York City. Now the treasurer was really nasty, and uh, she would she was doing things to her staff. I was a unit executive, so I was sort of on a peer relationship in terms of the hierarchy. And uh, I got real nervous. And one day she came to came to uh, the church center on Second Avenue in a limousine, and I kind of knew what that cost. And I knew something was wrong with that, and I mentioned it, and then I found out some other stuff. I found out it came out of the, the budget of people who were contributing money. So I made some noise about it, and I was told in a good Episcopalian way that I really shouldn't be talking about it because the presiding bishop really liked this woman, and I should be quiet. And finally, on a face-to-face -face basis in a meeting, I was told that maybe, maybe I just should leave if I couldn't tolerate it, and I did. Three years later, she was indicted, she was convicted, and spent five years in jail for embezzling $3 million. And I kind of had a notice for it. It's not that I knew what she was doing, I knew she was behavior was wrong. Because you know and I know, intuitively, you can frequently, if it looks like a skunk and smells like a skunk, it's what? It's probably a skunk. Well, I began to see that the integrity that I had known in the Episcopal Church and the connectivity between how we contribute with our time, talent, and money, our ability to um, make a witness that was really powerful, and I could name again and again hundreds of people, of little people and important people that that was true about. Any of you know ever hear of Archbishop Tutu? Yeah, South African guy. Well, one of the people I'm lucky enough to meet was Bishop Tutu, who's about that tall. He's an imp. And he's been through the process of anyone who's dealt with those who are really nasty people. He did, didn't he, in South Africa. They wanted to kill him. And one day, a group of us were talking with, with uh, Bishop Tutu in New York City. And he says, yes, he says, I like to run. And he says, I run right by all the houses where all the important apartheid leaders live. He said, you do what? He said, he said, well, I run by them and go, meh. <laughs> it's the kind of guy, you know, he is still. Yeah. Wonderful guy. And um, so he said, but aren't you afraid someone's going to shoot you? And so he's, he said, oh, I know that can happen. I know that every day. You know, Martin Luther King knew that, et cetera, et cetera. He said, but I just, I realized that I've already died to my faith, and I can't die twice. That was the level of integrity. He resolved the polarity of life, that duplicity of life, into an integration of who he was. And that's what I had experienced again in the life of the church. And I began to see this movement 30 years ago of disconnecting. And when that happens institutionally, I don't care what the institution is, it starts dealing with what I call the economy of scarcity. And it can be a family, it can be a business, it can be a not-for-profit, it can be a church. And it starts getting like this closed in, doesn't it? It starts worrying about its, its assets, there, its financial assets, its human assets, and it starts closing in and grabbing. Right before that happened in the work of empowerment that started in the early 60s in the Anglican Communion, the first presiding bishop I'd worked for put together a coalition of people um, out of a whole movement that had been going on for about 20, 30 years of empowerment globally. And because he said the mission and the vitality of reconciliation has to come from the grassroots, not from the top down. It didn't work that way. And to make a long story short, he managed to raise, with the help of hundreds and thousands of others, in North America, $175 million, the largest single fundraising campaign in the history of North American religion. The next presiding bishop starts taking, you know, starts not knowing how to do that and not wanting to talk about it because they're starting to get scared and they've won the day. The liberals got it, the, what I call liberal authoritarians. They're not real liberals. And, the, and so the church drew back and a number of us had represented that past and knew it well. 
You know why I started tithing? Not because the church told me to. The Episcopal Church doesn't talk much about tithing. I didn't do it because I was living in Oklahoma because of the fundamentalists. I started doing it because of Selma. I was in college. And I couldn't go down to the South. I couldn't leave Oklahoma. I had a job. I was at OU. I started tithing because I felt that was my little gesture at social justice. The power of love. The power, and what I thought the church was a great witness, and I think it was at that time. And in that way, still is in many ways. How much you time? About three minutes? Okay. <laughs> My friends, and I'll be with them tomorrow at breakfast talking about you all and the music. <laughs> are, we're, we're, we're guys, in this case they're all men, but that's just, just coincidental, who have our PhDs, MBAs, um, all kinds of other things. All of us have our, our master's degree and professional degrees. I mean, we're a whole bunch of different people. People have been deans of cathedrals and deans of seminaries and have been, uh, one of my cousins was a bishop and so on, that kind of stuff. And so we, people kind of, you know, we were in there with the quote, reins of power. And we've got, we've put it away and said, we can't do this stuff anymore. Number one, we're bored with the church because scarcity is no fun. We see things happening in the church that demographically are sealing its fate if it doesn't turn around. We see a society in which it has been documented now for the last 30 years that a culture of narcissism is overtaking every institution. Philip Slater, go back and look at the book, very good book, put that in your collection. Good book, about 30 years ago. And other writers and sociologists have been talking about the change of society in which community is becoming more and more difficult. So I end where I started. Thank you, Helen and all you others. Tell Nashua. And thank you all. Go to the picnics, have all the fun, do all these things, have a panty raid, whatever you do. <laughs> it's the power of love. And in a way, I do love all of you. I hope that I will behave that way. Because I don't always. Right, Kevin? <laughs>
deep in my heart because of that ethos and tradition. I really don't care much intellectually about theology. I know how to do it. I just don't care about it. I really never have. <laughs> One of uh, my teachers, Joe Fletcher, was uh, famous back in the middle part of the last century and the latter part as from a book he wrote called Situation Ethics, which was largely misunderstood, I think. And uh, Joe kind of, as it turns out, ended up, we ended up about the same place in the same time of life. He loved the tradition, but he could no longer really call himself an institutional Christian. That's an answer of sorts. Yes? Let's talk about the love of power. Do you have any ideas how humanity can get beyond that? Uh, good, <laughs> good question. How does humanity get past the love of power? I think the first way that you and I, anyway, can deal with it is looking in the mirror and resolving two issues. When I was 10 years old, I sort of looked in the mirror, I guess, and I got this message from the mirror that said to me as a 10-year-old, Ronnie, you're going to get old and you're going to die. And I spent the rest of my life realizing I'm dying. I think the first human being thing human beings have to do is to get clear on their mortality. They're not going to last for it. That creates a lot of humility. Second of all, each one of us then has to ask the question daily, how do I contribute to the power of love or the love of power? Why am I afraid? Now then, when you get into a community, or an organization, the question is, looking at the mission of the organization from that perspective, and I don't care whether it's for profit or not for profit, I, don't th I think those categories are really not very important. Because my experience in organizational development, so there are, there are sociological issues and economic issues, but really down deep, mission is mission. Because I've known some business people who I thought were fabulous witnesses to love, fabulous witnesses. So it's a question organizationally in our family and in our businesses, in our not-for-profits, how do we elicit from them with us a community sense of our obligation socially to be as loving as possible? Does that help? A little bit. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's such a big question, you know, but we, we can talk about that in all kinds of ways. Another question. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess religiously, is there a single example Single. Uh, the question was if there one event that had has made the singly made the most importance in my life. I think that probably two things. One, that story I just told about immortality, and then I was listening to what you were talking about about sexual abuse. I think, at least one of the others, was at 11 years old I was sexually abused by my sixth grade teacher. And my parents handled it extremely well, thank God, or whatever. And they, we, we did, there was, no, there was no terrible public stuff going on, I think that would have been really bad for me. And it was handled, it was a small town, so it was easier to handle. But I learned out of that two things. I felt that, sort of in a, again, in a language more of mysticism, I felt the two angels had come to live with me. And one was the angel of light, and one was the angel of darkness. And the angel of light taught me compassion, that I could even be compassionate for Mr. Hartzell. And I really was, no matter how much I hated what he did to me. I realized, at that young age, that he was less a bad man than a very screwed up man. And the angel of darkness said to me, you're not good enough. You are, you, you need to take care of yourself. And uh, all that kind of stuff that wants to hold me back and to make me feel like I'm a, a victim that can't deal with stuff. I say those two were certainly some of them, two of the most. Anyone else? One over here, one over here. Yes, please.
that's a wonderful question. That's another big event too. Um, Danny Pritchett was my high school buddy, and Danny Pritchett was a real serious Christian scientist. I mean, he 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 was really he knew what he was talking about. And I read uh, Mary Mary Baker Eddy's book, Eddie's book Science uh, Science and Health, which is about um, Christian science, so I could understand him. And we were roommates in college, and we would tell each other about days of events and some, some stuff in our kind of our religious comings and goings. And one day we sort of got into an argument. And we started getting alienated. And both of us had the presence of mind to go, time out. And we went back to telling our stories. And, it, and this works again and again. If you really want to engage another person out of any religious tradition, let them tell their story and tell your story. It doesn't make any difference what the stories are. If someone cannot tell that story, then I would say just walk away because they're, they're getting into they're getting into one of the, the love of power. They want to do you, you know. But if you can tell you the story, my gosh, you can, you know. I mean, and to me, I think the greatest thing in life, really, day to day, is. I've never met anyone I haven't learned something from, never. And so if you can learn, then you can engage, and that engagement will create reconciliation. I think that's really love. I think that's what it is. Thank you. Another question over here, ma'am. Yeah. What would you tell a family that um, previously has been Christian, lives directly across the street, literally, from a church? Um, we attended that church for a while. And now we're, we're trying to figure out where we stand in our faith and also not so much get into the religion of it. That's why we're not really wanting to attend the church. But what would you tell a family that is struggling with issues of faith that is so close to those that are deep in their faith? Um, I think, again, one of the things to do, if, if you're the person that you know, knows the family, Oh, you're the family. <laughs> I, I think one of the things to do is to find someone who is, um, that can listen to you and let you talk it out with, with that friend or that person or that other family and talk it out with no judgment, calls, no nothing, just get it all out and, and get into that kind. So you, because what that'll do for you, it'll help you and your family uh, process, particularly the parents, because they're going to be more, you know, or older children, because they're going to be able to process it um, and and talk it through, and then you'll begin to see. Because what you're really struggling for, and I commend you for the struggle, is to establish your sense of spirit, your your own spiritual depth, and how you want to practice that. And however that turns out, it's going to be good. There's, you know, it's all going to be good. And just find. Uh, in, in the language of the Celtic tradition, it's called, it's an anamkara, find your soul friend. He's just gonna, just gonna love you because they're gonna, and you'll know they love you because they'll listen. It's not, I really love you, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Who's gonna listen to you? Okay. Does that help? A, a little bit, yeah. And again, the question was about how to deal with a family that is going through a struggling, trying to, to express on the one hand, their desire to get away from some institutional religious stuff, but find still be find a way to be religious in their own way. Is, is that is that did I put it right? That, in addition to being surrounded by others who don't see things the same way I do. That do or do not. That, that don't. Do do not, and that's where again I would, um, and this is a great place to find people that you can talk to and talk with and are just going to like you and just listen to you because you'll t you can talk it out really it'll take time i've spent until and, and this is why i value helen and, and saying thank you and why i wanted to give you something is you did me a favor i've spent i've been working on this issue to try to figure it out intellectually um, and soulfully for the last four or five years just the grappling struggle goes back 30 years almost. It's a slow process. It's a long process. But you know what? That's the process. That's one of the greatest processes in life. It's a good thing. Over here, please. And one more question. Yes, sir. Oh,
is he says, imagine no possession. I wonder if you can. That seems to be a line of genius. Let me see if I've got the core of the question. And, 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 Okay, and again, the, 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 the line is, imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can't, oh. I think that imagining no possessions starts with realizing profoundly that we're mortal, that at the end of the day, we're gonna give everything up anyway. My cousin, who was, again, an MBA, a PhD, a dean of a seminary, dean of the cathedral at Topeka and Bishop of Arizona, Wonderful man. He and I are just totally alike. There's only one problem, and we've been talking about it now. It's already too late. He's sinking into Alzheimer's. And we've been talking about this issue. And he said, I'm giving up everything. Part of it, part of it is responsible ethical choice to quit driving at the right time, do other things that he needs to do to protect himself and his family and society. So he's made some very hard decisions. But now he's at a point where that would be too late, but he did it ahead of time. He, is, he was imagining no possessions. And guess what? At that point, he knows he's not only losing all his other faculties, his, he's losing access to his own mind. He's losing everything. I can imagine it, unfortunately. But guess what? He is a gift to me. He is a gift because he's my soul brother and because he's simply going where I'm going to end up going to in one way or another. Okay. Got to quit that. Thank you so much, Ron. That's really wonderful. Um, it's really crazy. It was crazy for me to realize that um, he was a big supporter, like of our of our Indiegogo campaign when we raised our initial funds just to start this, and to have um, support from past clergy of, uh, is just it's really surprising. It was surprising for me, um, but it's been such a wonderful. I've learned so much, and we've been able to learn from you so much today. So thank you so much, and we appreciate your contribution on all levels. Thank you.